Torn between two lovers, feeling like a fool. Loving both of you is breaking all the rules. Torn between two lovers, feeling like a fool. Loving you both is breaking all the rules. Now, some of you wouldn't even want to admit it, but you did recognize what I was doing there. I was giving you the words to a song that became a one-hit wonder in the mid-70s. Yes, it was that long ago. For a lady named Mary McGregor. Now, that single there sold over 2 million copies worldwide, and that was before 99-cent downloads. And so you see that this is a, a thing that even 30 years later now, it's in regular rotation on certain stations around the world. And so Torn Between Two Lovers, that catapulted Mary McGregor to at least a temporary form of fame and fortune. But the words to that song, you might not know, they were sadly prophetic of her own life. And it's in an interview in her own words later, Mary said this, I don't like that song. I never did. I never will. I didn't write Torn. That's what she calls it. You know, musicians just call it by the first word. She says, I didn't like Torn. I, it wasn't written by me, it was written for me, for me to sing. In the actual recording, it's kind of interesting as I read the article, it was done in a bathroom of all places. Now, some of us sing in the shower, and guess why? It's because everyone sounds good in the shower, but good singers sound even better in the shower. And so there she was in the studio bathroom and singing the song. And she said what it meant is that she was staring into the mirror, the bathroom mirror, looking at her own face as she was singing the song. And she says, you know, as I did that, I remember physically trembling at the lyrics as I sang them, torn between two lovers, feeling like a fool. Now, you might say, why would she tremor? Why would she shudder as she sang? Well, she said it herself that in order to give her best vocal performance, she said, I have to get emotionally involved in what I'm singing. I have to actually feel and mean and live it out sort of in my mind as I'm going through it. And she said, when I recorded that song, as I'm staring there in the mirror, I was thinking about the fact that I was deeply in love with my husband. She had been married five years at the time. And she said, the thought of being unfaithful to him or vice versa was very traumatic to me. And yet within a year of that song hitting number one in the charts, Mary's once happy marriage was ended. Now, what went wrong? Mary McGregor was torn between two lovers. That's what she said, not what I'm saying about her. And her other lover was not a man, strangely enough. You might say, oh, well, uh-oh, here we go. No, it was fame. It was fortune. And it was everything else that goes with it. The, the pressure of popularity as fleeting as it was, as little as her moment in the sun was, it was enough to tear her life in two. And so Mary closed the interview by saying, a lot of people, I guess, are torn between two lovers of some sort, or have been, or will be, and I guess that's why this sad song just sells so well. Now, tonight as we think about that, we're going to look not at a musician, but a minister, an interesting guy in the Bible, a life that was torn between two lovers, breaking all the rules, and ended up feeling like a fool. And his name is Balaam. Now, Balaam, again, is a very interesting figure in Scripture. He actually gets three whole chapters right in a row, and that might be rarer than you might realize at first in God's Word. You see Numbers 22, 23, 24 are all devoted over to this guy named Balaam. And that's a lot of coverage in God's Word. But there's also a handful of other references to this man, Balaam, scattered throughout the Scripture, and we'll look at some of them tonight. They're in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And what is interesting is not, that none of the reviews of Balaam's life are positive in any way. He got zero stars, really, all the way through. And sometimes I think what's important to look at is not only the good examples of Scripture, but the bad examples. And something important is found in the bad example of Balaam here in the Scripture. And that is what the central message of tonight's message is, which is that you can't have two lovers without being torn, without feeling like a fool in the end. Why? Because it's breaking all the rules. And what is it that were the two loves of Balaam's life? Well, first, we need to note that he did love the Lord. And there's some times where you say, man, this is a messed up person. Yes, it's true. Balaam had some problems, but he certainly did have a spiritual side. There's no denying that. You couldn't say that he wasn't spiritual. In fact, he was a well-known prophet. It was the way he made his living. He was a prophet for profit. 
He talked a great game, as we will see. And all the way throughout, he sounded very spiritual. He always said, hey, I must obey the Lord. I can only do what God tells me to do and go when God tells me to go and all that kind of stuff. And so Balaam certainly had, as many do, a form of godliness. But here's the problem. Balaam was still torn between two lovers in his life. The other lover in his life, the other love of his life, well, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, if you jot that one down, 2 Peter 2, verse 15, it says it this way, Balaam loved the wages of wickedness. The wages of wickedness, that's what he loved in his life. And so in other words, you see Balaam loving the Lord, but also loving the world. And as you think about it, you say, well, doesn't the Bible say that God loved the world? Didn't he so love the world? Well, remember, there's different ways that the word the world is used in the Bible. And it's a biblical shorthand for saying the sinful world system that you see all around you. You see that in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. 1 John Chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, and I'll read it for you. It says, Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, then the love of the Father is not in them. In other words, God's saying, Hey, don't be torn between two loves or two lovers. And then verse 16, it says, For all that's in the world. And look at this. And when it's talking about love of the world, it quickly gets to the word lust. Sometimes people confuse those two. It says, The lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It's not of the Father, but it's of the world. And so those are three things that really sum up the world's sinful system. The lust of the eyes, in other words, all the things you see. The lust of the flesh, all the things you can feel and must have, that feeling. And then you see the pride of life. That's the stuff that goes on in our mind that thinks we're something really special. And so you see three Ps is one way that I put it when I talk with guys especially and we talk about these things. I say, hey, there's possessions, there's pleasures, and there is power. And again, God is not against any of those in their own self, but he is certainly against those things when love turns to lust and when those are the things that drive our life. And also, I, depending on who I'm talking to, we'll talk about this, not the three Ps, but the three Gs, whichever one kind of hits you and sticks in your mind, which is the three Gs, gold and girls, that's if I'm talking with guys, guys if I'm talking with girls, and glory, gold, girls, and glory. Those three have been the demise of many a person. And if you watch MTV, and I wouldn't invite you to do it, but I was at the workout club the other day and they had it on the TV and I just sort of glanced over every once in a while and you know what, it was those things in abundance. Gold, girls, and glory. That was what it was all about. That's what the world is selling at every corner. And so they have quite a pull to them, don't they? We have to admit it. I'm not going to stand up here and say like some kind of pious preacher, oh, well, those things are so terrible. We don't ever want those things. We don't ever get pulled by those things as Christians now. No, but that's just the very reason it says torn between two lovers because it's a powerful pull. And so the important lesson that we're going to see tonight is how to keep from giving in to that pull, how to keep from being torn between two lovers in your life, and how to end up at the end of your life not feeling like a fool. And so for the sake of time tonight, as we look at three chapters, I'm going to summarize and hit a lot of the highlights, but I would invite you to go back and look at this section of Scripture on your own as you get home. So we'll start there in verse 10 of chapter 22, and you'll see two names right away that will be all throughout the study tonight. The first one, Balaam, the second one, Balak, okay? They're going to be easily confused, kind of, sometimes as you're looking at them, but I may even say one when I mean the other, but I'll try and correct myself, or you can point it out to me. But you see Balaam and Balak, and Balak was a pagan king, okay? He was the Moabitess, or Moabite uh, ruler, and he was afraid of Israel, as you see that section there, because Balak knew that there was no way he could beat God's people in a purely physical level. He knew that. And so he did what Satan does, in fact, which is he waged a spiritual war against them. Knowing that he couldn't just come against them outright, he says, hey, there's something more behind the scenes that I need to do. And so Balak had heard of a man called Balaam, okay? And so what you see is, as I mentioned, Balaam was a prophet for profit. He was a holy man for hire. He would do blessings for bucks. He would have cursings for cash. And so you see King Balaam calling upon this man Balaam. And, you know, they didn't have cell phones there, but maybe they did have yellow pages. So you see Balak going through plumbers, prophets, psychics. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Full, play, full page ads there. 
Blessings by Balaam. You always go with the full page ads because you figure they've been around the longest and they've got lots of money. They must be doing it right. You see Balaam's blessings, Inc. No job too small, no job too big. Bless your friends, curse your enemies. And he says, free delivery there. Oh, that's good. Volume discount's good. I want as much as I can get. We deliver. Okay, this is good. Now, Balak sends out some servants at this point over to Balaam's office, and he says, hey, I've got cash in hand. Go ahead and bring Balaam back to curse Israel. And so Balak is kind of waiting for this with bated breath. And so you see in Numbers 22.10 that Balaam does something very spiritual. He talks it over with God. And you see Numbers 22.10. It says, So Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent to me, saying, Look, a people has come out of Egypt, and they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. Perhaps I shall be able to overpower them and drive them out. And God said to Balaam, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam rose in the morning and said to the princes of Balak, Look, go, go on back to your boss. Go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to give me permission to go with you. Now, I kind of wish for Balaam's sake that this was all the Bible had to say about him. What if he only had these three verses that we just read, three or four verses instead of all the other verses that are in the Bible about him? Well, if this were the end of the story in his life, we would all say, wow, what a guy. Balaam would go down in history as a man of integrity, as a godly man who could not be bought at any price. And unfortunately, what we're going to see, as I've said already, Balaam was torn between two lovers. Read on with me in verse 14. It says, And the princes of Moab rose and went to Balak and said, Hey, Balaam refuses to come with us. And so Balak's response, it says, Again, he sent princes more numerous and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus says Balak, the son of Zippor. What a name. Please let nothing hinder you from coming to me, for I will certainly honor you greatly, and I will do whatever you say. Therefore, please come, curse the people with me. He's a, he's a cursor, but he's a polite one. It's nice. He says, please. And then it says, then Balaam answered and said to the servants of Balak, though Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold and that really nice camel out back, I could not go beyond, I added that, I could not go beyond the word that the Lord my God says to do less or more. And verse 19, it says, now therefore, please, you also stay here tonight. He's saying this to the representatives. He says, that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. Now, I don't know if you're paying attention closely enough to see what's happening here, but Balaam is torn between two lovers. And Balaam's other lover is upping the ante considerably, as you can see here and is often the case. See, it's true that Balaam does love the Lord in a kind of twisted, in a kind of watered-down way, as we will see, one with all kinds of mixed-up ideas in there that are non-biblical. But Balaam also loves the world very much. You can see it. You can see the lust of the eye. You can see the lust of the flesh. You can see the pride of life going on here. And you know what? It's getting pretty interesting, pretty intoxicating in his life. I don't know if you've ever been in one of those spots where all of a sudden the very lure that is very powerful in your life is being waved in front of your face. You think about it, different fish go for different lure, and, and you see that, that a fisherman knows, a fisherwoman knows, hey, what do we do to lure that fish? Well, I know. And see, Satan knows that exact little combo that's going to work here. So much attention, so much potential for more in his life. You see, Balak sending more and more, more people, more prestige, more power offered. Not the B team now. It's to the A-team, the A-list, the big names with the big bucks coming his way. I kind of picture it this way. Hi, the guy says, hands his card. My name's Cashflow Dollar. I'm the president of financial affairs for Balak. Maybe you've heard of him, king of Moab. I put the Mo in Moab. You want Mo money? We got Mo money. <laughs> you want Mo power? We got Mo power. You want mo of everything you've ever dreamed of. Just mo, mo, mo. What motivates you? Mo. All right. Well, you can have it. That's what you see here. Name your price. You want gold? We'll bring out the bling. You want glory? We'll make sure your name is in a big font in big lights. You want girls? Well, hey, you know what? We, that can be done discreetly. We can arrange that. 
wouldn't ruin your reputation as a godly guy. We can do it out of sight. Let's make a deal. Let nothing hinder you. You dream it up, we'll give it to you. The blank check has already been signed. That's basically what he's saying. You say the curse, we'll put cash in the purse. And so here comes lesson number one. You don't want to be torn in your life? Don't be for sale at any price. Don't even be for rent. You know what I mean? Oh, maybe for a weekend. I'm not talking a permanent sale of my soul or my integrity. I'm talking about one little weekend. That's a rental. See, if you have a price that you can be bought at, Satan will gladly pay the price. He will be happy to pay whatever price it is up front. And here's what you see in this section too. He will persist even if you resist. And he will keep coming back, sometimes with better and better offers. Is your soul for sale here today? I guarantee that you will get the opportunity to sell it. Is it for rent? Well, you'll get your opportunity sooner or later. If your love and allegiance to the Lord is up on the auction block, it doesn't matter how high the price is, it still can get paid. And the thing is, if you ask yourself and you answer it honestly and you say, man, I am torn between two lovers right now, be very, very careful. Be very, very careful in your life because compromise happens a little bit at a time. That's what we're going to see. And what you need to do is settle the issue that I am not for sale at any price not even for rent. Now, unfortunately, Balaam didn't settle it that way. He said it that way, but he didn't settle it that way. And what happens in Balaam's life? Well, he's still talking right, but he's stopping the walk. The walk is wrong now. The talk is right, but the walk is wrong. And that's a very, very dangerous transition in a person's life. You see, in verse 18, Balaam says, you know what? Even for a whole big, huge house full of gold and silver and that, wow, a big screen TV. How big? Wow, that's big. Uh, well, uh, I'll tell you what. Let me go ask God again. Maybe I didn't understand him the first time. Let me just clarify things with God. I just need a little bit of clarification. I'll be right back. And so verse 19, that's what you see him saying. He says, I'm going to go see what else God has to say. Do you remember what God said the first time? No, don't go. And so now he says, well, I, you know, no, maybe no is negotiable. So at this point, Balaam's life, if it were a movie, I think the soundtrack song would start to play. You know what it is. Torn between two lovers. He's about to be a fool. He's breaking all the rules. And so verse 20, you see, it's interesting. God allows Balaam to go. Now, this is where we have to follow the story very closely and, and understand the whole story that the Bible's painting here. Some very clear guidelines are given to him. God says, okay, go, but only do exactly what I say and only do exactly what I tell you to do. Now, some people right away would say, God says no, then he says go, which one is it? You know, did God change his mind? Uh, did God decide, oh, it's, an, it's a good idea actually? No, this is where it's real important to have three other words in your mind, which is three Ps again, the perfect will of God, the permissive will of God, and the preventive will of God. What are those? Well, this will go a long way in understanding why things and how things go in our life. There's the perfect will of God. That's what God wants for us, the best. He wants us to be blessed. He wants the best for our life. But there's a permissive will in God, which is that he says, you know what, I'm not going to force you. I am not going to twist your arm and make you obey me. I'm not going to make you a robot who is incapable of your own thoughts and directions. So I have a permissive will. There's things I'll let you do, but I'm going to tell you you're in a danger zone and you shouldn't be doing this. You aren't sinning yet, maybe, but you're headed that way. And then there's the preventive will of God. And this is where he finally, through either a judgment, if he's stopping somebody from hurting others, or, or even a a merciful thing, sometimes God will just stand in the way and say, I'm not going to permit that. That's just not the way this is going to go. And so you see those three things there. And this is the permissive one. This is the middle one where God is saying to Balaam, you know what? If you really want to go, you go. But I'm warning you, you're making a big mistake and you're walking into dangerous territory. And so that preventive will, God sometimes will stand in the way and we'll even get to see him do some of that tonight. But at this point in the story, what you see is the Lord lets Balaam chase his other lovers. Think about that. It's kind of a sobering thought to me that God loves me, but part of love is freedom. And you know what? As he is there free to go do what he wants to do, he says, Balaam, 
He's got other gods. He's got other lords. He's got other masters. He's got other lovers. And we see them already. Greed, gold, glory, the pride of being in demand. That's a big one if you've ever been in demand. And suddenly you're in the spotlight and everyone says, oh, wow, Balaam. Let's go get Balaam. Let's throw Balaam a big party. And so God lets Balaam do what Balaam wants to do. He gets to go chase his other lover, even though it's not what God wanted him to do. And so you see, I'll give you kind of a play-by-play -play through this next section. Verse 21, eager to earn. Balaam is up early, jumps on his donkey, and off he goes. Verse 22, God's anger is aroused, and he stands in Balaam's way along the way. And then verse 23, suddenly the donkey turns to the side. Balaam hits the donkey and keeps going. And verse 24, narrow path between two walls. Oh, it doesn't look like he's going to get through. No, the donkey turns and Balaam's foot gets crushed. Oh, it looks like a career-ending injury. No, he's back up again. Balaam hits the donkey again. Verse 26, the angel stands in a spot where there's no way to turn. The donkey lays down. Oh, it's all over. Now, Balaam here, he's furious. He hits the donkey with his staff. Now, there's no accident in this section of Scripture that it's a donkey. I mean, as you think about a donkey, right? There's other words that we think about, and I'm not going to say it. But infamous for its stubbornness, right? And as we'll see, the donkey here is more spiritually perceptive than this so-called prophet. Maybe Balak should have called the donkey instead of Balaam. He was a lot more spiritual. The donkey has discernment, see? And Balaam doesn't. And so verse 28, you also see God has a great sense of humor. And, you know, as you think about this, I love to laugh as I look at God's word, even sometimes in the middle of a very sad story like this. But the famous talking donkey here, it's kind of the uh, original Mr. Ed or the, you know, that related to him. But what does the donkey sound like? Well, we all know what the donkey sounds like now in modern day. It's the voice of Eddie Murphy. That's who plays the donkey, right? <laughs> Shrek and donkey, right? But you see the donkey there saying to him, hey, why are you hitting me? And the funny thing, I love it, Balaam gets into an argument with the donkey. If an animal ever starts talking to you, please just don't argue. Just listen. <laughs> see what it has to say. But this is what you see. The donkey says back, nah, -uh, you started it. You crushed my foot. This is what you see Balaam saying. You started this fight. You crushed my foot. And they're going back and forth. And he says, Balaam says to him, lucky I just have a stick because if I had a sword, I would kill you. Now, it's great because... Balaam's all emotional and excited, and it's kind of like the donkey's calm and cool and logical. The donkey says, look, we've known each other a long time, right? Yes. Have I ever done anything like this before, talking and doing all this kind of stuff? And Balaam, verse 30, says, no. All right, so now he's ready to listen, and you see the Lord opens Balaam's eyes. Look at what the donkey did for you, he says, Balaam. That donkey's your best friend. He wanted to help you. I, you wanted to kill the donkey, but he kept me from killing you. And sometimes we get so mad at the people who stand between us and our sin, don't we? We get so angry at that person. Why won't they let me go to my destruction? And you see verse 32, God confirms what we suspected so far, which is he says to Balaam, look, your way is perverse, Balaam. You know what perverse means? It means it's twisted. It means it's corrupted. He's kind of saying, hey, you're a two-timer. You're two-timing me. And I'm on to you, Balaam. And you're on your way to wickedness, pulled by the lure of your own lust. That's how it happens in our lives, doesn't it? In verse 34, Balaam said to the angel of the Lord, it's such a spiritual sounding thing at this point. Look, I've sinned. I, I didn't know. Uh, I know you said don't go, but I, but I went and I, I didn't know. And now you stood in, your, in the way and the donkey saw that, but I didn't. And now, therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. Now, he looks so spiritual at this point, but we have to be very careful. Again, when we see this in our own life, I'm not talking about judging others. I'm talking about our own life because the worst kind of lies are the ones we tell ourselves, the deceit that we can have in our own mind. Lesson number two, we see it here. Watch for God's warnings and take them seriously. Don't take them lightly. Watch for God's warnings. If you're being lured right now, away from God's perfect will, maybe you're still in the permissive will and everything's still cool, kind of, but you need to listen up. God is faithful during those times in our life to be sending us what I call flagmen. You know, out here in the construction area, sometimes you see him flagging people down and, hey, you're headed toward trouble. You need to go through this cautiously. You need to be maybe even considering a serious U-turn, you know? And unfortunately, as a pastor, one of the things that we do is we get to see people who have serious spiritual shipwrecks. We get the great glory of seeing people come to the Lord and wonderful things happen, but sometimes we also get to see the wipeouts. And 
I don't say, hey, as pastors, we never have them. Unfortunately, I can say, you know, I myself have made many mistakes even after coming to Christ. But here's the thing. I've never seen in my own life or anyone else's life that someone went flying off the cliff without God being very, very faithful to put people in their path to try to flag them down, to try to say, wait, stop, think about this. Don't just keep going. Turn around, bridge out ahead. And God is so faithful to do that in our lives. And we need to understand and, and heed those warnings when we see them. God never warns us for nothing. And over and over again, he kept telling Balaam, hey, warning, warning, you're going into a danger zone. And so God may even be this night using this donkey. <coughs> Pastor Scott, to say to you, hey, stop, think, turn around. You know, if you're... If you're in that danger zone. So ask yourself and answer it within the quiet of your heart. Am I torn between two lovers? Maybe even physically. Am I making some mistakes in those areas physically? But, you know, as we've talked about tonight, it's not even just that outward thing there. Sometimes it's that torn between two lovers in our heart where we really have two masters, as Jesus put it. Two lovers, two loves of our life. And... So often, again, the Lord will send us some speed bumps and he'll send us some hurdles and he'll send us some people who will come along and say, hey, I, I don't know, I'm concerned about this. And right now, if that's where we're at in our lives with those early stages of sin, still messing around with, still kind of flirt. It's just flirt. I'm flirt. I'm not doing it. I'm flirting with sin. It's harmless. It hasn't, nothing's happened. Well, that's the rationalization that we can all have. And I'm no stranger to it myself in my own life. You know, we can have two lovers in our life and we can start thinking that hey i can do this i can love the lord and i can still love the world i can follow god and i can still chase my other lusts and maybe for a while hey i'm breaking all the rules and i don't feel like a fool i'm getting away with it man this is great but see that's the whole thing it will eventually leave us feeling like a fool we will be torn in two in the end. That's what we see in scripture. It's what we see in life. And so it's a great visual as I think about it in my own life. There was a time I went over to a person's house and they had a, a boat. And uh, what I decided to do there was I was kind of deciding whether to get in or get out and everything else. And I took one step off the dock and one step onto the boat. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation, but I was still kind of paying attention to some other things, talking to other people. And all of a sudden the boat started floating. That's what boats do. It started floating away in the dock was still there, but the boat was moving, and, and I had to make a very quick decision. I don't know if you've ever had to make one of those, but I had to make a decision, back to the dock or into the boat, because if I didn't make a decision pretty quick, I was going to have a decision made for me, which would have been to get wet, humiliated, and possibly torn in two, two because I'm not the most limber guy in the world. So what I did, you'll be happy to know, is got into the boat. But what you see is God still allows Balaam here to press on past this moment of decision in his life and he even proves a point in his life. And that point is lesson number three, which is no one can curse what God has blessed. Nobody can curse what God has blessed. It's the last part of chapter 22. If you glance down at verse 37, you'll see these two guys finally meet face to face, Balaam and Balak. And what you see is Balak is kind of upset at Balaam, even though Balaam has come finally, you know, made this journey. Now, why was Balak upset? He was getting what he wanted, at least so far. Well, there was an element of pride. And if you read it later, you'll see all of these things. Balak is a king. He is used to people Asking, how high should I jump? When Balak says to jump, that's what they say. When, where, and how high? That's a pride. He was used to power. He was used to position. He was used to all of these things. And he thought his possessions could get done whatever he wanted to get done. And so now you see him kind of insulted because Balak didn't just immediately drop everything when he got the call from the king. He didn't run the minute Balak called. And so he kind of says to him, what took you so long, Balaam? Why the hesitation? Are you not in this? I mean, do you want me to call somebody else? I, I heard you were the best cursor in the country, but you know, there's other guys in the phone book. I can use other guys. Did you not believe that well, I could perform my promise? You didn't think I'd pay? What, you got a problem with me? And you got to remember that Balak here, he's a pure pagan, right? He's a wholehearted heathen. And in some ways, I kind of respect that. You know, someone who just, they are what they are. They don't make any bones about it. They just say, look, I'm a heathen dog, and I act like a dog. You know, that's fine. Cool, that's what you are. And you see him with one lover in his life. One lover. He says, I love the world. 
and the things in it. That's what I'm about, King Balak. And unlike Balak, who only had one lover in his life, Balaam, again, had that problem that is unique to people who have a little bit of God and a little bit of the world. You see, Balaam torn between two lovers. And Balaam loved the Lord. He did. No denying it. You see it in the scripture. But he also loved the world. And if Balaam had come in for biblical counsel, it probably would have gone something like this. Hey, Pastor Scott, I am torn. I am torn up inside. Uh, this is really hard time for me. You see, deep down, I kind of know I'm making a mistake. I mean, I know, uh, you know, there's this nagging feeling that I'm not doing this right, but I, I really want to have my cake and eat it too uh, is the problem. And, and so I'm, I'm kind of talking spiritually, I know, but I'm really kind of walking carnally and that's really where it's at. And, and, and still, but you know, God did kind of say I could go, I mean, sort of after the third time I asked him and, and he didn't specifically say I couldn't, so I can, right? Something like that. Well, here's the thing. To his credit, verse 38, Balaam tries to take a stand for truth. He kind of does. He kind of takes a half stand. He says, look, I think it's, it's fair to tell you, Balak, before we sign on the dotted line here, I can only say what God tells me. Remember, I, that's what I am. I'm a, I'm a man of God. And, he's, and Balak says, yeah, sure, whatever. Okay, I'll sign the contract. I'm not even reading it. Gentlemen, start your engine. We got some cursing to do. You know, so they're off on their way up to the mountains there, which is where they did the cursing. Now, the rest of section, the section here, there's four prophetic pronouncements. And I just want to divide them real quickly in your mind into two. There's two chapters and two prophecies in each. Two in chapter 23, two in chapter 24. And again, I'll, we'll just hit the main points of each one because they really can be boiled down to a few thoughts. And you see Balaam taking Balak up to a very high spot. And they there have some sacrifices. Now, right away, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you might say, well, this is a godly thing, right? They're doing the sacrifices that God requires. No, they're not. Don't confuse this with the God-given sin sacrifices that were given by the priests in the tabernacle. This had nothing to do with it. Remember, they're in something called the high places, the divining place, and there was nothing divine about divining. What is divining? Well, it's sorcery. And as gross as this is, I have to share it with you because I want you to be as grossed out as I was, which is it involved reading the entrails, that's the inner, you know, the innards, the guts, and the organs of sacrificed animals. It's kind of like this. You say, well, the cow's liver says you'll live, but the colon of the cow says you're cursed. You know, and so that's what he's doing, gushing through the guts and saying, here's the answer. Now, I, I don't know why people won't read the Bible. I mean, the Bible, at least you don't have to get that kind of thing going on. You know, but people sometimes think this is the way I'm going to get to God, gushing through guts. But I don't want to read the Bible. Okay, so Balaam was spiritual, but not real biblical, right? That's what we're seeing here. Maybe you know some people like that. Maybe in, in honesty, maybe you're a little that way. But you see, he believed in the God of the Jews, the God of the Bible, but he didn't really follow the Bible. You see, Balaam believed in other things, too. He believed in God and, you know, very broad-minded guy. And you see him doing and practicing some things that God outright forbids. They're very obvious. You know, you see it in Deuteronomy chapter 18. If you write that down, look at it later. It talks about these very things that Balaam is doing here. Sorcery, psychic stuff, witchcraft, occult. And many would say, oh, you don't believe in that stuff, do you? Well, I do and I don't. Here's the thing. Much of it's fake. Much, much of it's false. Mo much of it is pseudo and hocus pocus and smoke and mirrors and all that. But some of it's true, and there is a truth to it, and all of it is forbidden. Whether it's fake or true, it's all forbidden, and it's all off limits because of God's love, not because he doesn't love us. So if you're playing with that stuff, you need to stop. That's as simple as it gets. Now, a sure sign of God's grace, and it is abundant, is the fact that he still talks to this guy and through this guy. Isn't that interesting? He uses this pagan prophet with his pagan practices and he still teaches us some valuable truths through it. And just because a person talks to God or of God and says they speak for God, you know what it teaches us? It doesn't mean that they're really doing what God would have them to do. It doesn't prove they're godly. Something supernatural doesn't prove anything. And so you see lesson number four from the life of Balaam. It's be a walkie-talkie, not a talkie-talkie. A walkie-talkie and a talkie-talkie. I don't know if you've ever seen a walkie-talkie or one of those phones that has the walkie-talkie feature. It's kind of, you beep, beep, you know, and you can walk and you can talk at the same time. This is what people had before cell phones and all the rest of that. 
But there's something else that, that I refer to as a talky talky. That's somebody who can talk really spiritual, but that's pretty much all they do. They quote lots of Bible verses, and you know, it's amazing how much knowledge they have, but not a lot of wisdom. See, that's when you come down to what's the walk like? Okay, that, I've heard the talk, what's the walk? So I want to hear it, but I want to see it. And talk is so cheap, you know, we know that. We've all seen somebody who can talk a huge game. But when it comes to walking, it just never seems to happen. And so it's character that matters. And so before you follow anyone's example in life, or before you get really wowed by somebody's even seeming spirituality and get real impressed because, man, they got some superpowers. I even saw them do something and say something. They told me about something that nobody else knows and this kind of stuff. You go, wait a minute. What's their walk like? I've heard what their talk's like. Take a long, hard look at how they're living. Is it biblical or just spiritual? Because there is a difference. And you can ask questions like, hey, what is their fruit like? Is it rotten or is it good fruit? Are they torn between two lovers? Can I just look at them and see, hey, this person loves the world and the things of the world. Are they breaking all the rules? God's got some. Are they following the example of Christ or are they following some other example? And you see those things. Well, if you follow a person who is really breaking all the rules and torn between two lovers, guess what? You'll end up feeling like a fool along with them. And you see in chapter 23, the beginning of these oracles, the word of God, that's what we look at. And Balak's all excited. You can picture, you know, the king of Moab. He's, he's rubbing his hands together. He can hardly wait. Let's get to cursing, man. This is taking a long time. I'm ready. Let's curse. Okay, here comes the curse verse. Verse eight. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? This is Balaam talking. For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. There a people dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number one-fourth of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous and let my ear, let my end be like his. Now, as is sometimes the case with poetry, you read it and you say, yeah, what in the world was that? Well, let me paraphrase this prophecy again as the Hebrews understood and would have understood it. And even as Balak, the pagan, understood it. It's this. God's people are special. They're set apart. Look at them down there. They're not like any other nation. And God promised them they would be abundant like the dust of the earth. And guess what? Look at them all. And you know what? Balaam says, I wish I was one of them, man, because look how blessed they are in life and even more blessed in death. I wish I could be one of them. And you see verse 11, Balak says, what? That's my paraphrase. What kind of curse is that? What kind of amateur are you? That one stunk. I paid a big price to have a curse and this is what I get? I could have done better on my own. And so Balaam kind of says, look, man, it's not my fault. I did the best I could. I mean, you've got to remember, I opened my mouth to curse him. That was my plan. But I already told you I can only do what God says. I can only say what he says. Now, I don't know exactly how it happens, but in my twisted mind, I have this mental picture of the Kung Fu movies. You know what I'm talking about? Where the lips are going one way and the, and the soundtrack's going another. And I can't really do it up here. But you can imagine what I'm talking about, where Balaam goes, and if you read his lips, you go, that looks like a curse to me. But out of it's coming this massive blessing. And you go, something is wrong with this picture. And so that's what you see. And Balak is very upset about it. Now, the second half of chapter 23, this is the second pronouncement. You see that Balak tells Balaam in verse 13, hey, let's try a different place. Let's try a different spot. You know, that really didn't work that well. But maybe over there on that other mountain, let's go to the other side and see what we see. And remember, Balak wasn't an atheist. This is important to see. A lot of people say, oh, I believe in God. So what? <laughs> Balak even believed in God and gods. That's the whole thing. See, the, the understanding that they had in those days was, if you were a pagan, that God was regional, that there were many gods, and they kind of had their little jurisdictions. You know, They had their little maps drawn, and this is the God of this place, and this is the God of these people, and all that kind of stuff. Not the one God that is maker of heaven and earth, but little gods all over the place, and we believe in all of them. And so they're regional. It's kind of like a cell phone, if you think about that, right? When they have the local calling and, and the bad signal in certain spots, you know, you go by certain places and you go, man, the signal strength's real low. Well, you can imagine Balak saying to him, um, can you curse him now? Okay, not can you hear me now, but can you, can you curse him now? Can you curse him? Uh, how about over here? Let's see if God's spiritual strength, if his signal strength is still coming in, or maybe Balak 
And Balaam can just kind of do whatever they want to do. Get a good cursing out there on this other place. And that's what you see. Second location, same outcome. Verse 18, I'll take it up there with you in Numbers 23. It says, Then Balaam took up the oracle and said, Rise up, Balak, and listen. You know, you can picture him saying, Here we go. Here comes the curse. Listen to me, son of Zipper. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Behold, I received a command to bless. He has blessed, talking of God, and I can't reverse it. Now, looking at verse 21, I love it. This is the way God sees his people, and we've already seen that they had some sin, they had some problems, they had some difficulties, but this is what he says. God sees him through these grace eyes. He says, he has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them, and God brings them out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. There's no sorcery against Jacob, nor any divination against Israel. It now must be said of Jacob and of Israel, oh, wow, what God has done for them. Now, summarizing this real quickly, he says, hey, look up, Balak. Listen up, Balak. Son of Zipper, God has already said that he would bless his people and he's not about to change his mind. That's the way it is. He brought them out of Egypt and he brought them out for a reason. He's forgiven them and he's given them all kinds of grace. And when he looks at them, he doesn't see their iniquity and wickedness, although we all know they have it. And he says, and God is with them. And I love what it says there in verse 23. No sorcery, no divination against them. And I know maybe there's some people in this room even, that live in fear because of things that go on in your family and other places. But let me tell you, no sorcery, no divination against them. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. And so in the words of the playground prophets, as I like to quote them, you know what? They are rubber, you are glue. This is what he's saying to him. Whatever curses I say to God's people bounces off them and sticks to you, Balak. And then you see verse 23, oh, what God has done. And so, again, Balak says, wait, 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 stop, 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 stop. Don't say anything more, okay? I know this isn't really going so great. You know, two out of three ain't bad. Uh, well, no, it's bad so far. It's bad, and you aren't cursing them. And, and not only that, not only are you not saying anything negative, you're saying a bunch of positive stuff. You're blessing them. And so Balak, son of Zipper, says, zip it. Zip your lip. And, and the opposite of what my mom used to say, which is, hey, if you can't curse someone, don't say anything. That's what he was saying there. And so verse 20, or chapter 24, verse 1, we go into that, and it's, it's there that we see Balaam learning some lessons along the way. I, I like this. You see, again, he's got a spiritual side. There's some little response in his life in one way. What do you see there in verse 1? Balaam stops using divination at this point. He already had been, he says, you know, forget these guts. Forget this. I'm not getting these messages from animal organs. This is a bunch of bull. And then he says, you know what? I'm just going to talk to God. I'm just going to listen to God. And so what you see him hearing from God is there in verse 5. He says, oh, my people are so beautiful to me. This is God talking. He says, they're going to be living in abundance, water flowing. And remember, water was synonymous with life. When you're in the desert, water's a really nice thing. And you see him with a king and a kingdom prophesied there in verse 9. It says, everyone who blesses them will be blessed. Everyone who curses them will be cursed. This is a repeat of the promise to Abraham. And so you see, King Balak at this point just can't take any more of these twisted blessings and curses. He says, wait a minute. Balaam, that's three strikes and you are out. And so he even strikes his hands together, you know, or you know, that kind of thing, even that wakes you up. But you see there with Balaam and Balak, hey, he, want, he wants to probably slap old Balaam, but it was a sign of great anger and angst in that society to do that. And so he says to him, look, I'm not even going to pay you. Verse 11, Balak threatens not to pay Balaam's bill. He says, I wanted to honor you. I had the three G's and the three P's and anything else you wanted but your God is holding back honor from you. Isn't that what Satan tries to tell us? Hey, God is holding out on you. He hadn't given you the good stuff that I got for you. And you see, Balaam reminds Balak of their agreement at this point. He says, I warned you. I had to do what God told me. And so Balaam now goes home, or he's going to go home. But first, this is what he does. I, I see it this way anyway. He says, tell you what, Balaam. Tell you what, Balak. I, I, you bought three prophecies, and I know they didn't turn out the way you want them, so I'll tell you, I'll throw one more in for free. 
And it, really, it's the most amazing of the four. Before he goes, this is what he says, verse 16. The utterance of him who hears, hears the words of God, who has the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. And he says in verse 17, I see him, but not now. I behold him but not near. A star shall come out of D Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab. That's where old Balak was from. And it says, and destroy all the sons of tumult. In other words, everybody who is on the other side of what God is all about. And he says, I see him, but not now. I see him, but not near. What is he talking about there? Who is he talking about? He says, this is going to take a long time. This star, this scepter that's going to come out of Israel. Well, if this were the only place it said this, we might say, nah, I think you're reading a lot into it. But this, in the prophetic, poetic language that all throughout the scripture, you're going to see there is going to be a deliverer going to come, a savior, a messiah. It's called a messianic prophecy. And this is a very powerful one. And remember, coming out of a guy who's pretty messed up in a way, and so you see just one of the many hundreds of predictions that a king would come, a conquering king out of Israel, and make all wrong things right. And now you see Matthew 2.2 2 in maybe a different light. Matthew 2.2, 2, the, the magi say, man, I, we saw a star and we followed it. It just said a star's going to come out of this area. And remember, these were wise men. But we think, oh, wise men, that's really good, really godly. Well, if you know what magi or magi means in the original language, that's where we get the word magic. They were Magicians, they were sorcerers, they were stargazers, they were astrologists, they were mystics from the east who came to go seek after Jesus. And so as you think about that, I love it because what it means, it's not that you're going to see Jesus in the stars, but you know what, God, he meets people where they are. And if what they're looking at is the stars, he'll say, hey, over here, man, the real star is Jesus. See, that's the whole thing is that God meets people where they are, but he doesn't want to leave them there. And so even in some of these pagan practices, you see guys who were genuine seekers, they did find. Because if you seek, you will find. Now, if a person stays a seeker their whole life and never finds, then you say, well, you apparently weren't seeking. Because the Lord says, if you seek me, you will find me. Some people come through some very muddy waters to find the Lord. But it, what a different thing it is for a person to know the Lord and then dive into those muddy waters of all of that stuff. You say, no, that's the wrong direction. That's a much different situation. And so, well, you see verse 25, Balaam goes back to his hometown. And if that were the end of the story, you'd kind of say, oh, cool, man. Balaam, he learned his lesson, right? He left his other lovers. He got things straight with the Lord. He, you know, all this stuff. Now he's wholly devoted. Everything's great. No longer torn, no longer feeling like a fool. He got off to a bad start, but he came out with a good ending. Happy ever after. No longer breaking all the rules, right? Well, unfortunately, the story still doesn't stop there. And Pastor Pedro, I don't want to steal his story from next time, but chapter 25 uh, we're not going to go all the way through it. And some of you are saying, thank the Lord for that. We already went through th three chapters at breakneck speed. But let me give you just a little preview, just the very start of it. As Balaam and Balak were up on the mountains, you know, doing all this stuff, there's something else happening somewhere else, which is the Israelites are down there in the valley. And Numbers chapter 25, verse 1 says it this way. The Israelite men began to indulge in sexual immorality and idolatry with the Moabite women. And you'll get to hear the outcome of that. Now, again, this is the three Gs. We'd already seen him tempted with gold and glory, but now you see another lure being used in somebody else's life, which is girls. It's kind of like they're saying, hi, boys. Just wanted to say hi and show you how we worship. We're really spiritual too. Let me show you how we worship in Moab. And all of a sudden the Israelite guys are going, I'm thinking of converting to Moabitism. You know, this is really cool. And so two of the other references in, to Balaam in the Bible shed some incredible light on this darkness. It's that Balaam apparently sold a secret to Balak, a little secret. He gave him what he wanted in the end. Numbers 31, 16, if you write that one down. Numbers 31, 16 and Revelation 2, 14. You'll see them up here on the screen or you can write them there in your notes. Numbers 31, 16. I'll read it for you. It says, look, these women, it's talking about the Moabite women, called the, caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident at Peor. That's where it's talking about. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. Then you see... Revelation 2.14, this is right out of the mouth of Jesus explaining this situation with Balaam and what he did. He says, "For I have a few things against you. He's talking to a church, and he uses this analogy. He says, because you have those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, 
who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So what you see is while he was there giving these blessings, he was supposed to be cursing, he gives blessings and he says, that's all I could do. I could give four blessings. I couldn't quite do it, but I'll tell you what, on my way out, let me tell you a little something just to make sure I get my money. Um, there is one way to curse God's people. I, I, I just want to share it with you. He says, just get them torn between two lovers. Just get them to go after other gods. Get them to go under, after other goals. Listen, I can't curse them directly. I can't do that. But sin can. Sin can curse them. And spiritual and physical harlotry is exactly what you see him. You see him two-timing God spiritually and even physically. And so sin comes with its own curse. This is something we all need to know. Sometimes people think, oh man, sin, it's all forgiven, isn't it all? Didn't Jesus take care of that on the cross? It's real cool now, right? But sin comes with its own curse. And so you see there that Balaam is saying, I can't curse them personally, neither can you, not directly. But you know what? Even though they love the Lord and the Lord loves them, guess what? If you will send in some other lovers, you're going to lure some and they will be torn. They will be torn in two and they will end up feeling like a fool. And Balaam knew what it was to be torn between two lovers. See, he could speak from experience, personal experience. He knew exactly what it was and he was still even that. Lured away by his own lust. How sad that was. And so he tells Balak, this king, you know what? It worked on me. <laughs> you, you got me. Look what happened to me. And he says, you know what? It might just work for them. It might just work for them. Why don't you try it? And it did. And the blessed Israelites became cursed for a time because of their own choices and their inevitable consequences. And you might ask yourself, well, what happened to Balaam? You know, did God just let him off the hook? What happened there? Well, this is a little bit later in his life. Sometimes it takes time for consequences to catch up. But you see Joshua 13, 22, if you write that one down. As they're there fighting some battles, it says, The children of Israel, Joshua 13, 22, also killed with the sword, Balaam, the son of Beor, the soothsayer, the diviner, the half-hearted man among those who they killed. And so Balaam loved the wages of sin. You see that. But he also paid the price for those wages and the wages, the Bible said, of sin is ultimately death. And Balaam died as an enemy of God. How sad that was, he, even though he often spoke as if he was a friend of God and God's people. And so lesson number five, very serious, very sobering in some ways. Sin carries a built-in curse. It's kind of like a shrimp wrap package. I don't know if you've ever been to a store and they have the bottle of shampoo and then there's some conditioner and they put the stuff around it. Well, that's a good package deal. That's a buy one, get one free. But here's the thing. With, when it comes to sin, it's shrink wrapped together with a curse. It's kind of like, well, I want the sin, but I don't want the curse. I'm sorry. It's a package deal. You get them both. You go, well, I don't want them. I just want the one without the other. Well, you can't have that. I want the bad choices without the bad consequences. I'm sorry. They're a package deal. And so what you see in our lives is that no one can curse us from the outside, really. As he said, hey, this curse, God, God's blessed him. You can't curse what God has blessed. But here's the thing. We can still be our own worst enemy in life if we choose choices that come packaged together with curses. And even forgiven, sin still hurts. That's something I say so often. I hope I remember it. I hope everyone who ever hears it remembers it. Even forgiven sin hurts. And you would think that a person with so many lovers in their life would be the happiest person in the world, right? Oh, so many lovers. But you know, that's the most miserable person in the world. The most miserable person on the planet. Torn. A fool. Feeling like a fool in the end. And the same battle that went on for Balaam's heart and allegiance and his life goes on in every life, every soul. And a great question for us to think about tonight is, who do I love? Who do I love? And who loves me? Because the Bible says the way we love God is when we realize, I love him because he first loved me. How does he love me? Exclusively, passionately, completely. And he asks the same from us. Now, thinking about this, you know, it's, it's easy to think about the different extremes that we've seen even of evil and good in this passage and even in our own lives. And as you know, this week there was the Virginia Tech shootings. And I know that's on everyone's mind. It should be. I hope it is. None of those people who died that day expected to wake up and die that day, that's for sure. Except maybe the shooter. And so there's over 30 dead and, of course, countless people devastated. And so you see that is a great act of evil. I think we can all agree on that. Nobody denies that. Nobody says anything other than, man, that's hatred in its purest form. That is taking of a life. And you know what that is? What Satan is said to do. He has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. That is his plan. 
And the greatest act of love, we've even heard some of the stories, right? There are people who took a bullet to save somebody else, somebody who stood in the way so that someone else might live. And we look at those things, and even on a human level, we say, man, that's a hero. That's somebody who is expressing love like no other. And Jesus said it himself. Look, there's no other love that's greater than this, that you would lay down your life for the friend. And he says, that's what I did. I'm calling you friends, and I'm laying down my life to prove it. And so what is on the one hand? There's somebody who takes life and destroys it. On the other hand, the greatest act of love is to lay down your life for another. Now, again, thinking about it, we saw Balaam torn between two lovers, but really one of them wasn't a lover. Wasn't a lover at all. One is. God is a lover. But, you know, the world and all that's in it, just posing, just posing as that, acting like a lover and actually a hater. Perfect picture of Satan. A taker. One who takes life and takes anything along the way that he can. And sometimes offers things, sure, offers you the world. Hey, but at a price. I'll give you all of the glory, all of the things that you might want, but I do need your soul. That is one thing that I do need. And that's a bad trade, my friends, at any price. I don't care how many G's you get and how many P's you have. It does not matter. Jesus said, hey, you did a bad trade. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? For those passing pleasures. Yeah, they're pleasurable sometimes, passing. He says passing power. Yeah, that's going to come and go. Passing possessions, all of these things. You know, when Balaam died by the sword, none of the stuff that he got, the bag of gold didn't do him any good. And so you see that what a person needs in their life is to really see who loves you and who doesn't. Who really is the lover worth living for and dying for? And to many in this room, maybe, maybe a few, maybe many, you know what I can say to you? We need a new love in our life. We need a new love in our life and not just adding Jesus to a list of lovers saying, oh, I'll even put him at the top. You know, there's some other lovers in there, but I'll at least get him in the top three. It's pretty good, Jesus, isn't it? No, Jesus says, hey, no other lover. Why? Because I can only bless the parts of you that you really surrender to me. And so as you see in here, there's curses bundled in with sin, of course, but I love this. Let it burn into your brain. Jesus reverses the curses. Jesus reverses the curses. He became a curse for us on the cross that we might become the blessed ones of God. And so he was torn there for you, but he doesn't ever want you to be torn between two lovers. He wants to show you there on the cross how much he loved you. Now what I'm going to do is just take a time as we do here every time we meet. For anyone here who's never made a declaration of faith in Christ to take the time to do it tonight. And what I'm going to do is just ask us to bow our heads close our eyes. And during this time, I'm just going to pray. And if God is moving upon your heart for you to say, man, I want God to be the love of my life. I may have been a spiritual person, but I haven't been a biblical person. I haven't really understood what it is to put Jesus as the master of my life. But I want to do that. How do I do it? Well, all you need to do here tonight is open up your heart and your life. And the way you can signal to me that you want to do that is just by raising your hand. By raising your hand, you're saying, you know what, I want to say no to my sin, I want to say yes to Jesus. I want to turn from the things that have caught my eye, and I want to turn to the one who really is the lover of my soul. So if there's anyone here tonight who wants to make that decision, while our heads are bowed, I just ask you to raise your hand at this time and acknowledge your need, saying, I want Jesus as the Lord of my life. I know he is the answer. That's what we do when we know the answer in school or anywhere else we raise our hand. You're just saying, hey, I know he's the answer that I need. Anybody here tonight, if you want to do that, I see here in the front. Anybody else want to acknowledge, hey, I've had other lovers in my life, but I want to come to him, the lover of my soul, the one who was torn for me at the cross that I might live. Anybody else here tonight? For you whose hand went up, I'm just going to pray a prayer. These are my words that I'm giving you, but they are hopefully reflective of your heart. Father, I open my heart and my life and I invite you inside to be my Lord, my friend, my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean. I want to follow you this day and forever. And Lord, I ask that you would free me to love you only supremely and fully and to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.
listen, I, always, I also want to take the time here tonight before we go. Uh, there might be some of you who realize, hey, you know what the truth is? I do love the Lord, and I have given my life to the Lord. But slowly and surely, as can sometimes happen, I've been two-timing him. Maybe three-timing, four-timing. I've got lots of different competing passions in my life. I've got other levels, other lovers, and I'm living in that miserable middle. You know, that's one of the worst places to live. I'd almost rather be a hardcore heathen than a person who's kind of a Christian, kind of somewhere in there. You know what? Because sitting on a fence doesn't feel very good. And so you see in those things, too much of God to enjoy your sin, too much sin to enjoy God. God never meant it to be that way, never meant us to be torn between two decisions. So even tonight, if you know that that's you, I'm just going to ask a pretty bold move, which is for you to come to the front along with the uh, person who raised their hand, just to say, you know what, Lord, I want a new start. And I want to say here tonight and make a public declaration, I I have one love in my life, and that's the way I want it to be. And with God's grace and God's help, I'm going to do that.